It's Thursday, March 16. In the headlines, local news. Prime Minister Andrew Holness is slated to make his budget presentation in the House. He is expected to speak on the nation's first trillion dollar budget for the 2023-2024 fiscal year. In business news, Grace Kennedy implements new strategies for growth. Regionally, Antigua's Prime Minister Gaston Brown praised by Dominica's Prime Minister over heroic efforts on Liat. Internationally, Turkey floods kill 13 and authorities fear that death tolls will rise. In sports, reggae girls grappling with coaching issues. This is the news on PBC Jamaica. I am Maya Chung. The 2023-2024 budget debate continues today, March 16, with Prime Minister and Minister of Defense Andrew Holness making his contribution. The budget debate usually begins after months of intensive planning by financial experts. Such planning needs careful attention since it decides the welfare of the nation for the next 12 months. The government is proposing to spend a total of $1 trillion for the 2023-2024 fiscal year. This is Jamaica's first trillion dollar budget. The Parliament session is set to begin at 2 p.m. inside Gordon House. You can watch it live on PBCJ and participate in our live stream on all our social media platforms at PBC Jamaica. The Consumer Affairs Commission CAC has handled 1,268 complaints and secured more than $36 million in refunds and compensation on behalf of aggrieved consumers from April 2022 to present. The CAC CEO made the revelation during the JIS think tank series. The figures were reported by the Commission's Chief Executive Officer Dulcie Allen, who was addressing a Jamaica Information Service JIS think tank recently. Mrs. Allen disclosed that of the total number of complaints that have been handled so far, 882 have been amicably resolved. According to Mrs. Allen, this figure is a little lower than normal. The CAC, she said, has been having challenges during this year. She said, however, that as it gets closer to the end of the financial year, when records will be audited, the CAC believes the figure will look even better. Mrs. Allen pointed out that the electrical equipment and appliances category accounted for 23.62 percent of the the total number of complaints, while other services and utilities accounted for 22.21% and 13% respectively. Jamaica has started the process of onboarding import and export services provided by the main cross-border regulatory agency, CBRAS, of the Jamaica Single Window for Trade J-SWIFT platform. Minister of Industry, Investment and Commerce, Senator Aubin Hill, said when completed, this will result in tremendous improvement in the cost and time to trade across borders. Minister Hill was speaking at a forum on facilitating competitive, safe and secure cross-border trade held at the regional headquarters University of the West Indies, Mona, on March 15. J-SWIFT is a single electronic platform providing fully automated access to all cross-border regulatory agencies, enabling traders and their representatives to transact all businesses online. In 2020, Jamaica was ranked 136 out of 190 countries in the World Bank Doing Business Report for trading across borders in Latin America and the Caribbean for time to export, import, and for cost to export and import. Senator Hill also informed that there are several initiatives on the ministry's agenda to improve trade facilitation. Among them is the phased rollout of J-SWIFT across the border regulatory agencies and piloting the onboarding of all primary and secondary services of the BRAs on J-SWIFT. The minister also mentioned the full digitization of the permitting clearance cycle through J-SWIFT 
thereby achieving paperless clearance at both post-arrival and post-departure ends. He also mentioned the updating and modernization of the legislative framework governing cross-border regulation of trade and goods and the review of the BRA's fees and charges. The workshop facilitated by the Trade Facilitation Office sought to ascertain through presentations and discussions among key players Jamaica's status in relation to its trade facilitation reform program. The office also sought to identify opportunities for economic growth and border regulatory reforms. Lobster catching season closes on April 1 and runs until June 30. Fishers are being warned against catching lobsters during that time. The closed season is to give lobsters a chance to breed and repopulate and during the period, it is illegal to catch, buy or sell spiny lobsters. Chief Executive Officer at the National Fisheries Authority, NFA, Dr. Gavin Bellamy, says persons could face hefty fines if caught with lobster during the closed season. He described it as fishing without a license because you would not have a license to catch lobster throughout that time. The penalties are about $3 million or two years imprisonment, which can go higher. The National Works Agency is advising the motoring public that a section of the Trout Hall to Grantham Main Road, Clarendon, will today be closed. The road will be closed in the vicinity of the Old Orange Orchard in order to facilitate emergency drainage repairs. Community Relations Officer for the NWA's Southern Region, Howard Hendricks, says the section of road will be excavated in order to remove and replace a defective drainage pipe. The road will therefore be closed between the hours of 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. During the period of closure, the alternative route will be as follows. Traveling from the direction of Trout Hall toward Frankfield, motorists should keep right towards James Hill, then on to the Park Hall Road and travel along Cupid and Green River Roads, then re-enter the main road to Frankfield. The reverse obtains for persons traveling from the direction of Frankfield. Operators of large trucks and articulated vehicles are being advised not to use this route as sections are narrow and will not facilitate easy movement. Those motorists are being urged to use the route through Cave Valley or to plan their movements outside the time of the repair works. The culvert replacement works are expected to positively impact movement to major communities such as Crofts Hill, Spalding, Frankfield, James Hill, Crooked River, and Chapleton. Motorists are being reminded to obey the instructions of the flagmen and traffic signs are posted along the corridor during the period of works. And it is now time for our business report with Danita Rodney. Motorists will pay less for gas when they go to the pumps on Thursday. State-owned oil refinery Petrojam says E1087 down by 25 cents will sell for $167.82 per liter and a liter of E1090 up by 25 cents will sell for $172.29. Automotive diesel oil down by $4.50 per liter will sell for $196.12. Ultra low sulfur will sell for $206.96 per litre, following a decrease of $4.50. Continuing with a $4.50 decrease, kerosene will sell for $207.17. In the meantime, down by $3.06, propane cooking gas will sell for $68.95, while butane will sell for $75.42 per litre. Remember, retailers will add their markups to the announced prices. Grace Canada Limited, impacted by a lackluster performance in its money services business during 2022, said it will this year unlock new strategies aimed at recouping lost earnings and returning growth to the portfolio. Group Chief Executive Officer Don Webby, speaking at the company's investors' briefing on Monday, listed some of the strategies being implemented. We have been working very, very, very closely with Western Union, our partners, for 30 odd years. 
And we have come up with a strategy called impact. We talk about revenue and targeted marketing. We want to grow the market. And we want to make it um, more attractive for our brothers and sisters throughout the, the, the Caribbean diaspora, USA, which is by far the biggest market, Canada and the UK to send uh, money back home. So, you know, we're speaking about optimizing our network, um, the omnichannel experience, um, that app, the GK1 app, which we, we, we spoke about earlier. So we're looking at pricing, um, you know, being more consumer centric, compliance is key, always will be, and of course, marketing. Mr. Webby also said that the group is in the process of expanding and forging new partnerships. We have signed uh, with a major uh, retail chain in Jamaica where 50 odd plus locations will become Western Union locations and we expect that to be announced very, very shortly. So our network now is over 200 and we're going to be adding 50 more locations um, for Western Union, which is going to make it um, even more attractive for our customers um, to go and get their, their, their funds. I'm very excited about this. And this partnership that we were forming also has Caribbean legs where we can exp uh, expand to the Caribbean. Very, very excited about this. It has been long in coming. We have worked hard on this one. But finally, we are there at the contractual stage um, to, 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 to roll out. Now for your market updates. In foreign exchange trading for Wednesday, March 15, the U.S. dollar sold for an average of $152.65. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $110.57. The pound sterling traded for $183.34. And the euro sold for $161.29. In GSE trading, the GSE index declined by 341 points. The junior market index declined by 55 points. The combined market index declined by 838 points. And the All Jamaican Composite Index declined by 558 points. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 123 stocks of which 32 advanced, 50 declined, and 41 traded firm. Stocks advance for AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited, Barita Investments Limited, and Caribbean Cement Company Limited. Stocks declined for 13E Student Living Jamaica Limited, Access Financial Services Limited, and Berger Paints Jamaica Limited. Trading firm were 13E Student Living Jamaica Limited Verbal Preference, Blue Power Group Limited, and Simone Group Limited. The overall volume leaders were JFP Limited with over 200 million units, JMMB Group Limited 7.35%, Cumulative Redeemable Preference Shares with over 16 million units, and Wigton Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares with over 5 million units. In regional stocks, in Trinidad and Tobago, zero securities traded. On the Barbados Stock Exchange, Goddard Enterprises Limited was the volume leader with over 2,000 shares. They were followed by West India Biscuit Company Limited, which traded 100 shares. In regional business, the signing of a recent non-disclosure agreement between the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries and Venezuela PDVSA is a sign of positivity with respect to the Billion Dollar Dragon Gas Project in Trinidad and Tobago. Tuesday, Minister of Energy and Energy Industries Stuart Young signed a non-disclosure agreement with PDVSA signaling negotiations between the parties and the exchange of information towards the technical and commercial aspects of the planned development. Energy industry leader Joel Pemberton said this is positive news for Trinidad and Tobago. As you know, an NDA or a non-disclosure agreement is to maintain confidentiality between the parties, which is important and standard in any gas sales commercial negotiations. Um, so it really shows, shows in short order that we're making good progress and moving forward in what is, could be a challenging commercial negotiation. Mr. Pemberton spoke to TTT News via telephone regarding the signing of the NDA. Mr. Pemberton added that the fact that the minister was accompanied by other officials within the energy sector demonstrates the commercialization of natural gas, 
that will be derived from the Dragon Gas Project. Let me demonstrate the collaborative effort being taken to really commercialize the natural gas from the Dragon, Dragon Field in Venezuela. As you know, there are parties, from my understanding, to the arrangement, and it's always important that all parties are in the room uh, because that will facilitate faster and easier negotiations. The Dragon Deal is expected to give Trinidad and Tobago access to the field, said to be holding about 4.2 trillion standard cubic feet of natural gas. Charlene Lewis, TTT News. In international business on the U.S. stock market, volatile trading gripped Wall Street on Wednesday. Here are the details. Volatile trading gripped Wall Street Wednesday as fears of a banking crisis were revived. Stocks plunged sharply, then paired losses, with the major indexes closing mixed on the day. The Dow shed just under 1 percent, the S&P 500 shed seven-tenths of a percent, and the Nasdaq closed up a hair. Trouble at Credit Suisse piled more pressure on the banking sector. U.S.-listed shares of the Swiss bank hit a record low after its largest investor said it could not provide more financing to the bank. But by the end of the day, Switzerland's central bank pledged to fund Credit Suisse with liquidity if necessary. The panic came just one day after shares of U.S. banks staged a strong recovery, with regulators enacting emergency measures to prevent contagion after the collapse of SVB Financial and Signature Bank. Some investors believe aggressive U.S. interest rate hikes by the Federal Reserve caused cracks in the financial system. Joy Yang, head of global product management and marketing at Market Vector Indexes, equates the Fed's policy with using a wrecking ball instead of a scalpel. In using this wrecking ball, they can, you know, kind of throw it at a target. But what we realize is that this ball is coming back. So some of, you know, the damage that we're seeing now is really kind of um, what was happening from their intervention with, you know, monetary easing. And so we've yet to see what's going to happen with monetary tightening and what damage is going to come out of that. First Republic Bank tumbled more than 21 percent, while PacWest plunged nearly 13 percent. Trading was halted several times for volatility. Big U.S. banks, including J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup and Bank of America, also dropped. U.S. Treasury yields fell, with traders now expecting equal chances of a 25 basis point rate hike and a pause at the Fed's meeting next week. In market days for oil, oil prices clawed back some ground on Thursday, recovering from the previous session's 15-month lows. Bread futures were up 54 cents at $74.23 a barrel, and West Texas Intermediate crude rose 43 cents to $68.04. And that was the Business Report on PBCJ. I'm Denita Rodney. In regional news in Barbados, speaking during her budget presentation, Prime Minister Mia Motley has announced the extension of existing measures and the introduction of new ones to boost the greening of vehicles in the island. The Prime Minister also announced plans to assist the owners of public sector vehicles in making the move to electric or hybrid vehicles. We are not leaving out the public service vehicles. We are going to establish a three million low interest revolving fund to be managed at fund access for the acquisition of or for the conversion to electric or plug-in hybrid vehicles, CNG, or solar-powered passenger vehicles for the public service vehicle sector. Sir, we want the PSVs to come along in this transition to a green economy. That is why we start with $3 million. It will be low interest, and if we need to increase it, we shall increase it. We are also going to introduce for the benefit of postal workers, effective the 1st of April, 2023, a $25,000 loan limit to acquire electric motorcycles in this country. I know that they have been calling for an increase in limit, and sir, I feel particularly happy to be able to announce it since the first introduction of loans for postmen for motorcycles was as a result of my initiative in 1994 to Mr. Arthur as Prime Minister then. So I'm happy to be able to ensure that you can also 
move into the green and not have to spend significant sums of money on gas. In Antigua, Prime Minister Gaston Brown has received gratitude from Dominica's Prime Minister for his efforts to keep Liat flying. Roosevelt Skerritt commented on the issue during a news conference in the Nature Isle this week. Prime Minister Skerritt also shares the view expressed by Prime Minister Brown for regional governments to contribute financially to an airline instead of leaving travel solely to private carriers. Garfield Burford reports. Comments from Dominica's Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt in Rosa, which are certain to reverberate around the sub-regional capitals, and beyond. You're going to need a construct like Liat. And that's why I want to thank the Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda for his heroic efforts in at least having a couple of the planes flying and, and providing the service, albeit not to the original level um, that, we, that we are accustomed to. Prime Minister Scarrett calls the transportation woes a regional emergency. He says he was criticized when his administration took the decision to invest in Liat 1974, but he says he cautioned his critics that Liat's services are crucial to the region. He therefore has this view about how to address the challenges of regional transportation. I do not believe that there's any other entity that can reasonably be expected to, re to replace the functions of Liat in the region. And government's investments in Air transportation in the region cannot be replaced by private sector investments only. The governments must invest in regional, intra-regional travel. He says that's because intra-regional travel is a public good and private entities will only fly routes which are commercially viable. But will his government put its money where its mouth is? This is affecting all of us so badly. You understand? And our economies in a dramatic way that since the departure of Liat from the regional scene. Okay, and, and I'm saying that Dominica is prepared to, as we've met, and we're prepared to, to play our part financially. But you absolutely need a construct like Liat to, that will be complemented by the private sector airlines to give you the kind of service that you really need in these islands. The comments from Prime Minister Scarrett are almost a replica of what Prime Minister Brown told ABS News in a recent interview. I'm of the view that the OECS subregion and Barbados should have a public sector entity to form the core of regional transportation and that that airline, whatever it is called, could be supplemented by the private carriers. One of the risks that um, countries in the region run by relying almost extensively on private sector entities is that they will not operate on profitable routes and if they do so it will be at an extortionate cost. So two Prime Ministers on one accord on the way forward, can they get more buy-in from their other sub-regional colleagues and would this consensus translate into tangible investments or will turbulence continue to affect Regional transportation. Canadian logistics company CS World Cargo 2000 Incorporated on Tuesday launched its operations in Guyana with massive plans to expand across the country in the coming months. Reports are the company will provide more jobs for locals. To give back to his country of birth and with the hope of bringing international standards here, Canadian logistics company CS World Cargo 2000 has invested approximately $80 million to start up its operation in Guyana. And according to director of the company, Chandy Singh, the idea to set up the business was touted by one of his customers. We go above and beyond to make sure our customers get their product in a timely manner at a good price and communicate with them throughout from beginning to end. Our team is dedicated to serve, to provide service above and beyond to all of our customers. This is what we will bring, we'll be bringing to Guyana. Our passion for this business and our desire to give back to the Guyanese community, something that is very close to my heart. CS Cargo is focused on investing in the Guyanese community and its people. We're here ready to hit the ground running and continue to go above and beyond our, for our customers. 
Singh, who addressed a gathering of people at the launching ceremony on Tuesday night at the Marriott Hotel in Georgetown, said the company's five-year plan will see offices being set up in Linden, Burbies and Essequibo in the coming months and the provision of job opportunities for Guyanese. And to expand its operations, they're hoping to establish a warehouse and a monthly million-dollar distribution center. Meanwhile, in his future address, Minister of Public Works Juan Edgel said Ghana will become a hub for real connectivity between the Caribbean and South America. And while the country is experiencing massive transformation as it welcomes international investors and companies of great magnitude, Edgel said the government is taking every step to ensure the citizens of the country are not left behind. But the truth about it, Ghana has changed. The meticulous comprehensive approach to doing business is very, very important. The things we are doing now are multiplied times what we did before. And as a country, we don't only need to do more, we need to do it better and we need to achieve excellence in a society where we are modernizing. And basically what a logistics company with the magnitude of uh, CS World can do, basically helps you to engage and do business and participate, shop, have your delivery done, sell, get your products wherever you want it to go, any part of the world, any day of the week, in any season of the year. And on the international scene, floods caused by torrential rains have hit two provinces that were devastated by earthquakes last month, killing at least 13 people and increasing the misery of thousands who were left homeless, officials said. A number of people were reported missing as well in Wednesday's flood. We have more from Al Jazeera. Heavy rain since Tuesday night have inundated the cities of Shan Liorfa and Adi Amman. Schools in Shan Liorfa were closed on Wednesday. Fintan Monaghan reports. This man had a fortunate escape. Police, rescue workers and civilians have been helping to save those stranded by floods in southeastern Turkey. Several people have died. In many areas, the emergency services were overwhelmed. You see, this area is completely submerged. Authorities couldn't set up pumps to discharge the water here. There are cars stranded here, but they couldn't find pumps to discharge the water. The flash floods are hitting areas already struggling after last month's devastating earthquakes that killed more than 48,000 people. Families forced from their homes by the quakes are now being flooded out of their tents. <laughs> As you can see, we managed to relocate our tents and move to the park. We managed to surround the tents with stuff to stop the water coming in. The mayor of San Yorfa was heckled as he surveyed the damage. Many were already unhappy with the government's response to the quakes. After yet another disaster, patience is running out. Heavy rains since Tuesday night have brought flooding not just to San Yorfa, but also to other cities like Andiaman. Authorities have shut down hospitals and schools in some areas. Rescue work is underway, but there are fears the death toll will rise. Fintan Monahan, Al Jazeera. In sports, we start the ball rolling with football. The reggae girls are set to compete in the CONCACAF Under-20 Women's Championship, set to begin in exactly one month's time. But their coaching staff is incomplete. This after previous head coach Xavier Gilbert was promoted to the senior team and the contract of the assistant coaches had not been renewed. The Under-20 reggae girls are drawn in Group E alongside Honduras, Bermuda, Anguilla and French Guyana, who they will face in their first game on April 14 in Nicaragua. The tournament is being used as a qualifier for the 2024 FIFA Women's Under-20 World Cup. And that is the news on PBCJ. I am Maya Chung. You can follow us on our social media platforms at PBC Jamaica. Thank you for watching.